Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar, uh, QIS. And we are looking at people care. And the first aim that we are looking at under people care is the one of unity. But under unity, we're going to be looking at inclusion and diversity. My name is Patrick, and I'm going to be uh, making this presentation. Uh, at Crane, I serve as the Church Partnerships and Children in Families Programs uh, Manager. So when we talk about unity, we're basically looking at us working together as a team to achieve our goals. And uh, in a united team, we respect each other, we listen to each other, we support each other, and we're also working towards reaching the same goal. And uh, unity is something that has to be uh, made intentional within the culture of an organization. A united team uh, doesn't just happen by mistake, but there has to be intentional actions to ensure that we achieve unity within the team. Of course, there are different activities that we could engage in to build unity. And for Christian organizations, prayer, is one of those where we get opportunity to pray for each other, but also to pray for the work that we're going to do because we recognize that none of us is able to um, do this work in our own strength, but we also recognize that the work we do is a calling and a gift from God unto us. Then of course, regular opportunities for all workers and leaders to meet to discuss plans and projects and Part of it here is we're all working towards the same goal, although we, are, we have different roles within the team. So it's important for us to be able to discuss what is happening and how each of us fits into what is happening. And uh, part of building unity is the leaders creating and exemplifying a culture where all people are respected and are able to express their opinions. And part of the reason we charge the leaders is because most of what happens is picked up from what the leaders do. And so when people see the leaders get away with something, then they know this is what is acceptable. So the way the leaders conduct themselves, most times will reflect on how the staff will also conduct themselves. And so if the leaders are the ones exemplifying the unity and the mutual respect, then it's easy for the staff as well to pick that up. Uh, organizing team building activities, this is one that uh, many enjoy doing, and you could do so many things within these activities, but it would be good to have activities where people work in groups so that they are able to understand how each of them contributes to the group setting, but this would also help you to see how people are gifted differently, because uh, you find that when you place people in a gift, those who are leaders kind of come up, those who are good at getting into the doing come up, those who have that brainstorming also begin to come up. And so these activities can be fun, yet reveal uh, a more efficient way in which your team could work together and how you could have people engage. Under Unity, we, we had three standards. And uh, the first standard is that all workers are treated equally, regardless of sex, race, race ethnic or social background or disability and are shown respect regardless of their position and role in the organization or church project. The second standard is the culture of the organization or church project allows people to express differences of opinion. And the third standard is there is a safe and respectful environment for workers, children, and everyone the organizations come into contact with. Now these standards are what we looked at last week and uh, you could check either your email or our social media platforms and you could see a much deeper presentation of each of these standards uh, following the six essays that we've been doing for all our QIS models. And so um, I won't get much into this, but I'll move quickly to where our focus is, uh, the theme of inclusion and diversity, because when we talk about a team, we are talking about people that are different coming together to achieve one common goal. And so you definitely want to uh, have everyone feel they are part of the team, regardless of how different they look like. 
And so our organization, schools and churches should commit to and aim to promote inclusive diversity in thought, voice and composition. And just thinking about this, um, all of us have different opinions, um, different ways we see things. We're not saying that every opinion will be accepted, but there should be room for every person to express uh, what they think about an issue. And as we listen about this, we are able to make informed decisions in regards to the direction that the organization is going to take. And so there shouldn't be uh, locking people out of the door, locking their opinions out of the door, uh, just because they are different uh, from us. And of course, we have to think of um, um, the decisions that are being made and where we are including people are they relevant to them and to their position within the organization? And uh, there are certain aspects of, uh, of decision-making that are not relevant to certain positions. And so you may not necessarily engage everyone, but we are saying you engage everyone who that decision uh, is affecting directly. And so this means all staff are treated equal and not discriminated against based on now, this is a much longer list where we have race, color, sex, language, religion, political, other opinion, national or social origin. You think of uh, property owned just because so and so drives and another one doesn't. Place of birth. Um, in Africa, we have not everyone is born in a hospital. And so you wouldn't want to use that to measure someone's status. But when you also think of things like disability, age, marital and family status, health status, place of residence, economic and social situation. You don't want to discriminate based on those different aspects there because uh, many times they, they may not even be uh, relevant to the work that is being done uh, by the organization, okay? Now, since we're a Christian organization and we're looking at this based on what the Bible teaches us, we're going to look at a few uh, passages from the Bible that talk about or that paint a picture of what inclusion and diversity look like in uh, biblical times. And we'll try to do this chronologically, starting from Genesis 1, uh, 26 uh, to 27. And when you look at Genesis 1, um, the Bible says, I'll read 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And part of the idea here is that God uh, created people who are different, but yet all of them are created in his image. What is mentioned in Genesis 1 is male and female, but the idea remains that whether you're male or you're female, you're created in his image. And this extends even to other people of different races compared to ours or different ethnicities. When we look at God's people, we find that they were also ethnically diverse and they actually welcomed people from different uh, nations to be part of them. In Exodus chapter 12, as they're coming out of Egypt, this is what we are told in verse 38. Many other people went up with them as well as large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. And here when it says many other people went up with them, it is saying that as they were moving out of Egypt, it wasn't just the Israelites that moved out, but they had uh, some Egyptians and probably some people from other nations that were within Egypt that actually went out uh, with them. And so you kind of find that um, God's people were still welcoming to people who are different from them. And when you look at numbers as well, you kind of find so many laws in there, but those laws were given to cater for foreigners who are also referred to as aliens in some versions of the Bibles, and they came to live amongst the Israelites, and God never did ask them to send these aliens away, but rather he was telling them, welcome them, they'll live like us, they'll be part of us, and um, they won't bring say the worship of other gods to us that's why we would welcome them and so as people who are diverse come there's something they find within an organization a group of people that they go with so if it's your organization they find your goal so they are not coming to distort the goal of the organization 
but they are coming to work towards achieving the goal of the organization or the church. When we look at Jeremiah 38 to 39, as well as Acts 8, now those are big uh, readings that you could read later on. But the idea here was when God was thinking about redemption um, and saving man, he didn't just think about the Jews who were his people who were select, but he thought about all people. And Gentiles here is the word that is used to refer to people that were not Jews. And in Acts chapter 8, you find the church being dispersed and going out because when Jesus commissioned them, he said, go first to Jerusalem, then to Samaria, then to the other parts of the world, meaning they were to reach all people, but they had confined themselves to one place. And so the church of Jesus Christ is one that was diverse. Now, when we think of Jesus' disciples, they came from various backgrounds and social and political affiliations. Within Jesus' disciples, you have Matthew, who was a tax collector. He was working for uh, the Romans, you know, and he's from an elite group because tax collectors did make a good amount of money. But within the same group, you find people like Simon, the Zealot, and Zealots were people who were very radical politically, who wanted to overthrow the Romans by force. But you also found within the same groups uh, people like Peter, who were fishermen. Now, fishermen were some of the lowest class of people. But all these coming from diverse backgrounds, different political affiliations, yet they were brought together and um, worked as a group, uh, which we now know as Jesus' disciples or the apostles. Jesus' ministry was also to a diverse number of people. You remember that. Uh, he reached out to save the Gentiles. And actually the Gospel of Luke uh, does a good example of showing the different non-Jews that Jesus reached out to. And that's why you find a parables in there like that of the 10 lepers, which emphasizes that the leper who came back to give thanks was the one who was um, the Samaritan. Then you find the story of the Good Samaritan in there as well, kind of putting the picture that Jesus' ministry was not just limited to Jews, but to a diverse number of people. Then, of course, within the church, we find that uh, different people are brought together, and actually we are told that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither male nor female. It doesn't mean that um, all of us are the same sex or gender, but basically what it's saying that when we are in Christ, we are all equal, whether we are male or female, whether we are um, African or American or whichever nationality or race we may be. We are one in Christ. And last, last but not least is the picture of the church in the future from the book of Revelation. Revelation does emphasize that um, the people who worshiped God are from every tribe and language and people and nation. And so they were made into one people, but they came from a diverse background. And you can see how many verses within Revelation go ahead to uh, explain that so that we understand that God's kingdom is one that is diverse, but is also inclusive of different um, types of people. And we could go on and on just showing how God appreciates, loves, and welcomes uh, diversity. Key areas for encouraging inclusion and promoting diversity, and here we're looking in the workplace, and um, the four main areas we'll focus on for this day, and the first one is recruitment and selection, and the basic idea here is, one, we think of prioritizing skills, and competencies, as well as academic qualifications, and these to suit the role and the company goal. Because uh, sometimes people have skills, very good skills, but they are not suitable for the role that we are thinking about, uh, or even their academic qualifications. Now, those three are areas that uh, you can easily compare people and not be discriminatory, unlike when you compare them based on their race and other aspects that we mentioned before, because these cut across as well. When we think of working conditions, we want to ensure that we encourage an environment of mutual respect. So when people come to work with us, we should be able to respect them, and they shouldn't feel like there are less of people in our workplace just because 
they are female or just because they are female, uh, just because they are from this tribe or from that country, but rather all of us are respected regardless of where we come from and regardless of those background things that we cannot really change about ourselves. Thinking through reward and benefits, um, the idea here is the rewards and benefits for each role are clearly identified and applied in a fair and consistent manner. And what most organizations would do in this case is they would have a document that guides in how rewards and benefits are administered. And because these documents are made prior to even uh, considering staff, it means it's not biased towards a particular staff. Now, at the moment, many organizations uh, have people already working for them. So you want to make sure that the documents you come up to consider these are not biased by the staff you have at the moment, but they should be documents that uh, can be used even if you were to change staff at some point, say uh, some people left uh, at some point and you create new staff, it should be a document that can still apply to them and it's not tied to particular individuals or tied to a particular uh, group of people so that it is fair and inclusive. When we think of promotion, we talk of uh, staff development and progression opportunities. And we are saying there should be um, a level field of sorts whereby we are able to uh, provide this opportunity for everyone that if there is opportunity to go for training, it is open. Now, I'm not saying that everyone should go for every training that's happening and so on, but think through things like, is this relevant to the work they are doing? And if it's relevant, let them go, as opposed to picking someone for whom it's not relevant for the work they are doing and just taking them because they are your favorite person to take for that training. Um, sometimes in organizations, you hear things like, this person uh, is the one going for the training because they also took me for their training. And yet that shouldn't be things we consider. It should be more of, what is fair, what is consistent, and something to do with their role within the organization is more fair and consistent as opposed to um, other issues that we could bring up. Now thinking through strategies and initiatives for encouraging inclusiveness and promoting diversity. So before looking at which areas should we primarily focus on, they were not the only areas, but now we are thinking through what kind of strategies, what sort of initiatives can we engage in order to promote and encourage inclusiveness and diversity? And we'll still look at four of them. And we'll start with trainings and team building activities for staff. And part of this is, we've talked about team building before and we've said it's to help the team gel, but also to help them appreciate each other. When people play different roles as part of the team having fun, it's easy to appreciate their uniqueness because you say, hey, they may not do this like me, but the way they do whatever else they're doing is really good. And so we can easily welcome them. But sometimes we also need to teach people and explain to them why there is such a beauty in embracing diversity and inclusiveness. Other times it's about opening people's eyes. Like um, when we talk about people living with disabilities, sometimes people uh, make their decisions or their prejudgments of them based on wrong information. And so we need to correct that information and show them that, hey, even people living with disabilities are able to do much more and a great part of the team that we have. When we think about another strategy would be um, appropriate policies. And what we are saying is our policies must guide and enable us to achieve both effectiveness in our work and good quality of working conditions are for our staff. And so you're thinking the policies you come up with, and we've talked about this, uh, should be those that do not discriminate amongst the staff. They don't bring about the other discrimination that we had. Then we think of exemplary action by management. And uh, this is uh, what we think, um, how does management um, treat other people, and then people will be able uh, to do that. Then when we think of um, 
The fourth strategy is concerning consultation and communication. And we said we should involve people in decisions that affect their work as well as their performance. And so once we consult with people, also inform them of decisions that have been made and how they have been made, then we are able to include them and not to shut out their opinions. Now, at this point, I would love to hear from the rest of us that are listening to this presentation. Um, what do you think, especially in regards to um, the strategies that we should take in order to make our workplaces more inclusive? Someone would have to help me in case um, there are any hands that are raised. St. Paul's Chibando, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I don't know whether you would like to give an example because maybe that's what I have. You have outlined the four areas and they, I think they cover almost everything. Can I go ahead and give an example that we have? Yeah, that's okay. Um, at our school, uh, I am going to give two examples. When we are developing the things and we had to, at times we had to handle most of the areas in vernacular so that they can understand exactly what we are trying to develop because most of the policy issues um, affected them also. So they, they were part of developing the policy documents and they submitted their contributions. Then secondly, um, we have a practice every year um, that towards the end of the year, we organize a get together party and before then about a month before we write names of each member of staff the teachers the cooks askari the secretary all those the cleaner we write names of the name the name of each member of staff and we put we we fold the papers such that any member of staff can pick one name and the name you pick is is the person who is the friend of year cook at one time and at the end of your party you will have to have you will present a gift to that person that is the friend of the year so in that way we built a spirit of togetherness. They, they knew we, we were part of them, despite the fact that uh, these are teachers, these are scaries, this is a cleaner. Somehow it built a spirit of togetherness. Those are my examples. Thank you so much from St. Paul Chevando. I don't know if there's any other before I, I, I make a few comments. No other chat for hands. Okay, Paul, go ahead. Um, can you see my, I, I worked with an organization one, at one point where all of us were male until we got some few ladies. Then one time one of the ladies uh, uh, was worried was expecting a baby and we didn't know what to do because we had not thought about uh, maternity leave in the policy. And I think that one of the things I have learned is that we've got to take and sit back and say, if we're not, the, we are many times we're the norm. What, who are the people on the fringes or on the margins? Who aren't we thinking about? That might help us to find out, to discover that there are things we've never thought about. So it's just sitting back and thinking, who is um, not the norm for all of us? What is different? Who are on the margins? Who do we usually forget? And hopefully that can help us rethink how we do our own business develop strategies of being more inclusive. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Paul, for that uh, contribution. And it kind of goes to uh, part of what we talked about in the in the video that we did concerning inclusiveness, where we need to also review and monitor and review what is happening or how we are doing in regards to inclusiveness. And sometimes it takes uh, situations like what you went through to open our eyes. But if we're able to think ahead, then we are better prepared uh, for such incidences because you wouldn't want a situation where uh, something uh, goes wrong just because you didn't think ahead. So where we're able to think ahead, uh, we do that. Uh, one of the things um, I think that came out from what uh, the representative from St. Paul Chivando was saying was where we could get representatives for different groups. Like the last uh, point on the strategies, consultation and communication, because I was thinking of uh, his school, which is quite a big school, and you can't really have everyone sit down together or go ask everyone, but you could find a system where they are representatives for each group of people within your organization uh, so that you're able to get opinions from say the teaching staff the non-teaching staff patrick we've just lost you as you said non-teaching staff John? And the question is about our beneficiaries. So we've talked about the staff that we have. I would like to think about our beneficiaries. How do we promote inclusion and, and diversity when it comes to our beneficiaries? So we have about um, five minutes. So if you could uh, share a few points, um, in that regard, it would be really great. Again, if um, Mim could help me see any hands that are up, I'm not able to see that. Um, while people are thinking, uh, Patrick, of uh, putting their hands up, let me ask a very difficult question. Um, there's a lot of donors from various parts of the world now who are saying that inclusion should be of those of various sexual orientations. How do you think we should handle that in a biblical way? Wow, that's, um, that's a difficult question, just as you said it. And uh, if someone wants to jump in, you are very welcome. I think one of the things we need to recognize, first of all, is um, the Bible is very clear about certain things. And the Bible also calls on us as Christians to stand for what is true and what is right. And um, it would be good based on our biblical convictions uh, to give appropriate responses to some of the demands that we get that we think are not um, proper. And um, when we think about um, some of these issues that are raised, you have to think of how does the Bible deal with some of them and uh, that would help guide your response to something like that. But also keeping in mind that the Bible has many things people do that it doesn't approve of, and we ought to be at a point where we're helping people to see what is good and acceptable in God's sight, and why as an organization we don't embrace that. Um, we'll be looking at policies at some point, and within our HR policies, there would be what we term as acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. And for Christian organizations, those are guided by what uh, God's word says. But it would be good to hear from the others. We have about three minutes um, to go. Okay, um, 
Helen has written in the chat, in regards to your question, my thinking is that all positions should be given equal opportunities for both male and female employees to compete. Okay. And uh, I see Humphrey and Paul have both unmuted themselves. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, sorry. Go ahead, Humphrey. I just wanted to contribute to the answer that Patrick was giving in regard to Nim's question. I think it's very, very important for as an organization or as organizations to stand by what we believe in. For instance, under Crane, our values clearly state our fear for God. Uh, we believe in God and we believe in the standards that Christians live for according to the scriptures. And so even as much as we want funders, it's always important always to be clear from the word go for them to know what as an organization we stand for, what our values are, what we do and what we cannot do. Otherwise, if we pay attention more on what we are getting from the other side, we might end up compromising on our values that were set, which would be unfortunate for us. Paul, you were going to say something? We've got just three and a half minutes before our time. Um, as I think about the, the woman that Jesus healed that touched his, uh, his garment and uh, she was bleeding. So she was a woman who was not supposed to be among communities because she was seen as unclean in that culture. And uh, when uh, Christ learns that she had, uh, somebody had touched him and he had lost some of his power, this woman has been healed. Um, the way Jesus referred to him, I wanted to look that up in my scripture, was very personal. And I think Jesus came and loved everyone in spite of, he loved all of us in spite of who we are. And as an organization, we might have very good and positive values about what we think should be. And I think we should hold on to those values, but love each one that God has put in our way. Sometimes we say, hate the, hate the sin and love the sinner. And we forget that in that statement, we do not recognize that we are sinners. All of us are sinners. So we can say that sin we do not agree with, but love the person. And as, an organize, as organizations, we've got to have our values very clear and say, these are things we do, but we uh, would want to love everybody that God has put in our way, not compromising those values. Thank you. Over to you. Have your hand up. And I um, yeah, I was just, I wanted to address the question that you've got there, Patrick, about in, ensuring inclusion to beneficiaries. Um, and just to note that uh, if you're targeting a specific group of people, for example, girls or those with disabilities, uh, that it wouldn't be um, exclusion to, to just be aiming a project at them, for example, because by that nature of that project, you're bringing in inclusivity for, those, for that specific group of people. Um, so I just wanted to raise the point that it, diversity doesn't necessarily mean you have to be including every single group of people in your project, although you should think about um, those on the margins in, you know, in, in every area. Um, so in that example, it would be thinking about uh, those with with disabilities or, you know, um, the people who might be forgotten otherwise, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to include, you know, every single person in your, your projects. Um, and another thought that I had there was just making sure that it's accessible. Uh, if you're doing a project for people with disabilities, how how can they participate and how can they have their voices heard in what they actually want or, or what is helpful to them? Okay, um, thank you so much. Those thoughts just are noted. We... Patrick. Yes, please. Just a few seconds and we're gonna cut off.
Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. And I think um, we've gotten some pointers on how to respond uh, to some of these questions, including the one uh, that was asked um, verbally by name. Uh, please join us again when we have our next webinar next Tuesday at 